Welcome everybody to today's lunchtime lecture by Dr. Karen Smith. Um, looking at the list of participants in this session, we've got people from all over the world and probably all of you know Karen pretty well. Uh, so she doesn't need much of an introduction, but for those few of you who may not know her that well, uh, Karen earned her master's degree in geochemistry from the University of Cape Town in 2008 and obtained a PhD in geology from the University of Alberta in Canada in 2013. Uh, from 2014 to 2020, she was employed at the Gemology Institute of America in New York City uh, as a postdoctoral fellow and then as a research science scientist. Karen is a specialist in natural diamonds and their mantle host rocks from, around, from deposits from around the world. I think everybody is familiar with her work, uh, particularly those of you in this session. Um, her research has included studies that use mantle xenoliths and diamonds uh, to investigate what's going on in the upper mantle and the deep earth, as well as tectonic process that is, processes that affect the mantle and result in the formation, stabilization, and destruction of continents. Um, today, Karen's going to talk, talk us through GRIB uh, in Russia, which I'm sure will be an interesting talk. So with that, I'll mute myself and Karen, you can take over. Uh, thank you, Craig, for the great introduction and thank you for the invitation uh, to speak to the society today. Um, so as Craig mentioned, and as you can see from this beautiful image, I'll be talking about um, not the diamonds, but um, the peridotites from GRIB um, in Northwest Russia. Um, so I need to just acknowledge um, all of my collabor collaborators. Um, so first off, the samples um, for this project came from Elena Agasheva. Uh, she provided the samples. She also did a lot of the, she did all of the major and trace element analyses. Um, she crushed the rock, she picked the olivines and then sent the olivines um, to us in Alberta um, to do the rhenium osmium and PGE work. Um, so the rhenium osmium and platinum group element work was done um, in Graham Pearson's lab. Um, and Sarah Woodland um, assisted a lot <laughs> with those analyses. Um, and uh, the Rini Masmian PGE work um, was funded by GIA um, during my time there. Um, so uh, the rock record for the first 500 million years of Earth's history is very sparse. Uh, worldwide, there are only two localities that have Hadean rocks. Um, these are both in Canada. Uh, so the Nouveau-Agatouk greenstone belt um, on the Superior Craton um, in Quebec has 4.4 GA mafic amphibolites and also 4.1 GA gabbros. Um, and then the famous Acasta Nice complex in the Northwest Territories um, also has um, this 4.02 um, tonalitic gneiss. Um, aside from um, these, these rocks, um, we also have detrital zircons that are a very important record um, of Hadean Earth. So um, I just haven't listed all the localities for Hadean zircons globally here, but the most famous example that everyone should be aware of is Jack Hills um, in Western Australia, which has the 4.38 detrital zircon that John Valley analyzed. Um, but the full range is you know, going from 4.4 to down to, um, down to 3.3. Um, and then a local example is um, in Barberton, um, the green sandstone bed that has 4.1 GA detrital zircons. But once again, the range also extends to much younger, um, down to 3.3. Um, there are various other localities that also have, um, have Hadi and zircons, of course, um, but just for, for brevity, I've just listed, um, listed these two. So understanding the Hadean rock record is important because we need to unravel the origins um, of, the, of Earth's oldest continents. So we wanna um, study Hadean and Archean um, rocks so that we can understand how the oldest continents formed. Um, so what all these rocks have in common is that they occur, oh, I wanted to just add this in, the world's oldest rock is not in Minnesota. Um, so if you Google world's oldest rock, you get this image. Um, 3.8, so that doesn't quite make it into, into the Hadean. So world's oldest rock, not in Minnesota. Um, but what all these old Hadean rocks have in common is that they occur in regions of the earth known as cratons. Um, so this is a map showing the, the distribution of Archean cratons globally. And this is from Ken Condy's compilation um, in the book, Earth's Oldest Rocks. Um, so cratons are uh, stable portions of the Earth's crust that often preserve 
Hadean to Archean, um, Archean rocks and Hadean minerals, or like these zircons that we see um, in Jack Hills. So um, the ro rocks that I'll be talking about today are up here, uh, the Baltic Shield, um, Karelian and Kola Kratons um, here in um, Northwest Russia. So Kratons have long-term longevity uh, or long-term stability um, because they have this keel of depleted lithospheric mantle. Um, so this is depleted compared to the convecting mantle uh, because of repeated episodes of mount depletion. Um, it's depleted in calcium, aluminium, and um, other such elements. It's less dense than the asthenosphere. And it's also seismically fast compared to, seismically slow compared to the, to the global average. Um, so the cratonic lithosphere is, uh, is very deep. Um, so these, these roots below the cratons are 150 to 200 kilometers deep. Um, and because they have this cool um, conductive geotherm compared to the convecting mantle, it's very conducive to diamond formation. Um, so this is an image taken from Shari et al, uh, modified from Tappet and Tappet, um, showing this, uh, this uh, thick root of lithospheric mantle below craton um, and showing an abundance of diamonds there that are then sampled by kimberlites um, and brought to the surface. Of course, there are also diamonds that, um, that form deeper in the sublithospheric mantle, um, uh, but we're not too concerned about how those diamonds form um, today or here at GRIB. Um, so for those people who may not be familiar um, or who don't work on the mantle, um, what rocks can we expect um, in the cratonic lithosphere? So there are peridotites, um, which are the most common rock in the cratonic mantle. Um, and uh, lurzolite is fertile peridotite, and this contains clinopyroxene. So you can see these bright green chrome diopsides. Um, and then hartsbergite is more depleted. Um, it has garnet, orthopyroxene, um, and olivine, and um, little to no clinopyroxene. Um, and then here on the left are eclogites and peroxenites. Um, so eclogite is bimineralic, um, it contains garnet and clinopyroxene, um, and then peroxenites also have the addition of um, orthopyroxene. Often these have uh, basaltic bulk compositions um, that um, suggest that they have origin in the oceanic lithosphere um, and then were potentially subducted back in uh, to, um, to depths um, in the cratonic lithosphere. So the most common rock type is peridotite, but eclogite and peroxenites um, are less common, but certainly a very important part of the rock record in understanding the origin and formation of the cratonic lithosphere. So how do these cratonic roots actually form? Um, so there's two main, main models, um, and depending on the region, some combination of these would be considered um, for the formation of the lithospheric keel. Um, so the first is high pressure melting in a plume-like setting. Um, and the second is low pressure melting in a setting um, similar to modern mid-ocean ridges, and then followed by um, um, subduction thickening. So these same processes actually contribute to craton destruction. So the very same tectonic processes can either form or destroy uh, the cratonic lithosphere. Um, so we have evidence um, that mantle plumes um, have either thinned or destroyed the cratonic lithosphere. And this is you know, Southern Superior, um, Northern Slave Craton. Um, and then also subduction, potentially more shallow, shallow subduction, um, destroying the Eastern North China Craton, um, and then Western North America, the Wyoming Craton. Um, and so here's just some, some examples of how shallow subduction or flat subduction contributed to craton thinning. So if you have flatter subduction, it potentially um, reworks and you have thermal activation of a larger portion um, of the cratonic lithosphere, and that then contributes to, um, to craton refertilization and potential weakening and eventual destruction. A uh, similar thing um, in North China where flat subduction uh, is also being proposed as the mechanism for um, craton destruction um, here um, in the Eastern uh, North China Craton. Um, here's the example from the Superior Craton where plume related 
lithospheric thinning occurred around the time of the mid-continent drift um, at 1.1 GA. Um, so this is um, a seismic image uh, for the Superior Craton. And um, so it shows that uh, the majority of the Craton has seismic speeds that are faster than the global average. Um, however, here in the Southern Superior Craton, around um, a time in the mid-continent drift, this thinning um, of the lithospheric keel um, occurred. However, within 400 million years, the, the, lith the lithosphere, sorry, within 400 million years, the lith I can't even say that, the lithosphere had rethickened enough for diamond stability uh, because we know that the Victor diamonds um, had formed around 720 uh, million years ago. And that was work that Sonia, Sonia Orbach did. Uh, in the slave craton, um, we know that the Mackenzie plume at around 1.3 GA um, significantly thinned um, the cratonic lithosphere, and it was only around 80 kilometers thick at this time. But once again, within a couple of hundred million years or 700 million years, um, the lithosphere had thickened, um, and through to the present day, the lithosphere is more than 200 kilometers thick. Um, and then also, you know, we know there's lots of diamonds um, in northern Canada. Certainly all of these are diamond bearing, Artemisia, Jericho, um, and Divic. Okay, so now on to um, the grip prototypes. Um, so the Kola Karelian Cratons, um, there is some, not a lot of consistency in the naming <laughs> for this region in the literature. Some people call it the Fenoscandian, some people call it the Baltic Shield, um, but certainly there are the Kola and Karelian um, Cratonic provinces uh, within the larger Fenoscandian or Baltic Shield. Um, so here's a very simplified um, geological map um, of this region. Um, so we have the Karelian Craton here in Finland and Northwest Russia, um, the Murmansk Craton um, on the peninsula here. Um, and then there are a lot of Archean rocks within this region, uh, but I've just chosen to shade it all as the Lapland Kola origin, because a lot of these rocks have been reworked significantly at 1.9 during the Lapland Kola origin. Um, so the oldest rocks across this entire region are 3.5 to 3.1 GA. Um, no Hadean zircons yet. Um, and then um, the continent, all, the, all these um, continental terrains collided um, and stabilized around 2.8, 2.7. But where this region is different to many other cratons is that it experienced significant proterozoic reworking um, because of rifting and breakup between 2.5 and 2.1, and then collision again uh, between 1.9 and 1.8. So we had collision, rifting, collision. Um, and so we want to know, actually, let me just show here as well, just to show the sub-provinces a little bit better. So here's the Karelian province. Um, here's the Mamans Craton here. Um, but then they also put the Balamarian province um, and the Kola together into the Lapland Kola origin. Um, so certainly um, some people call this the Kola Craton um, and then the Karelian, um, but all of this has really been reworked um, during, um, sorry, go here into the zoomed in one, during the Lapland Kola um, continental collision um, at, at one point at 1.9. Um, and so it's not always clear what happens here across um, across the White Sea into into Northwest Russia. Um, and so um, here my co-author, she has a map that extends the Kola Craton actually here um, into the Archangelsk region where Grib and Lomonosov um, occur. So really Grib is um, here within the Lapland Kola origin, uh, but this is part of the Kola province that has been reworked um, at this time. Um, so the main questions that we have is we wanna know what the influence was of all this protozoic tectonic activity on the Archean mantle um, and of course it's diamonds. Um, so did all these tectonic processes make or break the cratonic lithosphere? Was there Archean mantle that was subsequently thinned um, during these processes and then rethickened um, after these tectonic processes subsided? Um, or was the majority of the lithosphere created 
um, during the Proterozoic, um, during this tectonic thickening. Um, so understanding these processes um, and their consequences uh, is important for the diamond exploration industry because it determines which areas to target. Um, and you wanna have a better understanding of this before uh, you spend a lot of money um, on exploration product, um, projects, um, which may not yield, um, yield diamonds. Um, and so here's just uh, some beautiful images of the Lomonosov diamonds um, that I photographed when I visited the, uh, the Lomonosov mine um, in 20, a while ago, 2016, I think. Um, and so they have beautiful colored diamonds, um, including these beautiful pink um, and some greenish and quite a few, quite a few yellow diamonds. Um, okay, so I'll be talking mostly about samples from, or only about samples from the Grib Kimberlite. Um, so this is, these are all the Kimberlites in this area erupted between 390 and 340 million years ago. Um, and here are some of the samples that we worked on. Uh, we only worked on peridotites. Um, so um, Elena sent me um, olivines um, that she had picked um, from these peridotites. And we analyzed the olivines uh, for the Arrhenium osmium PGE content. The reason we didn't do whole rock analyses um, is because you can see these samples are heavily infiltrated by kimberlite and quite altered. Um, and that um, this kimberlite infiltration and alteration um, is not really what you wanna analyze. And so it's better if you pick out the olivines um, because olivines are a excellent host for sulfides and other PGE um, containing um, minerals. And so we're not actually, even though we're analyzing the olivines, we're actually targeting the nano micro inclusions contained within the olivines um, and not the olivines themselves. Um, but we're certainly digesting um, all the olivine um, during analyses. Um, and so all our samples are um, lersolytic based on their garnet chemistry. Um, there, there are three um, samples that classify as lozolites, but they have no coexisting clinopyrite scene. Um, uh, so is that a Hartsvergeid or is that a lozolite? Um, then we have one depleted dunite, um, and then one of these uh, lozolites are, um, is diamond bearing. And so this is just compared to uh, the garnet xenocrysts where certainly um, the lozolites um, do appear to be in the majority compared to the Hartsburgitic um, assemblages. So as I mentioned before, we know that um, the area below Grib has um, a thick lithosphere. Um, and this is also shown on this, although this is, uh, this is a global map um, and this, the resolution here is in great, certainly we can, it does indicate or suggest that there is a thick lithosphere um, below this region because it has fast seismic velocities compared to uh, the global average. Uh, we also know that this region has a thick lithosphere uh, based on the presence of diamonds, of course. Um, and then we did some geothermal barometry um, and geotherms were calculated using fit plot um, that shows that the lithosphere is um, at least 200 kilometers thick, depending on um, which PT combination you use. Um, and so on the left, all the greens um, is Taylor 98 versus nickel and green 85. On the right is brain cola and nickel and green. And then in the middle is just the two, the two combined. Um, so there's some detail here, which I won't go into, but really just shows that um, the lithosphere asthenosphere boundary is at least 200 kilometers thick, if not um, up to around 230, 235 kilometers thick. Um, and certainly here is also, um, uh, this was based on um, CPX xenocrysts, um, and here's some other geothermal barometry done as well. So we've known for a while that there is a thick lithosphere uh, below this, this region, but the question is then whether it's an Archean lithospheric keel that has survived through all this protozoic activity or whether the lithosphere is predominantly protozoic. Um, yeah, and so that's basically, basically what I've just said there. So we know there's a thick crotonic root. We have fast seismic velocities. Um, geothermal barometry also indicates a thick crotonic root. 
but we want to know whether the cratonic lithosphere was preserved or whether it was rethickened re -thickened, um, during or after um, the Proterozoic. Um, so we picked olivine from 17 of our zinlets. Um, the olivine magnesium numbers range between 91 and 93, um, and that's shown here. The diamond bearing lozolite um, over here in yellow. Um, and so certainly the um, olivine magnesium number does not correlate uh, with the presence of garnet and kind of pyroxene in the rocks because we can have we have a lozolite here that um, is more depleted has olivine with a more depleted magnesium number uh, but a dunite with a less depleted magnesium number so olivine magnesium number does not correlate with the presence of garnet and kind of um, but this is certainly consistent with with a model that um, is gaining traction that shows that a lot of garnet and kind of pyroxene in the cratonic lithosphere is of secondary origin, um, and that olivine likely records the initial mouth depletion, um, but then garnet and kind of pyroxene were added in um, later on. And certainly here, you can see that garnet and kind of pyroxene sort of intimately associated and sort of in a vein-like fashion um, on, this, on the side of the sample here. It's certainly not uniformly distributed um, all through this lozolite. Um, so what are the osmium um, ages uh, for these peridotitic olivines? So before I get into that, just for those who aren't familiar with how we obtain these ages, I uh, just wanna give just a, slight, a quick overview of what we do in the lab to obtain, to obtain these ages. Um, so before separation chemistry, um, we include a, a known amount of an isotopic tracer solution or a spike. Um, and these are this is a spike solution containing certain isotopes um, of each element that, that we would like to analyze. So we digested the samples at high pressures, high temperatures in inverse aqua regia. This can be done either in a carrier's tube or in an Asher vessel. Um, in Alberta, they use an Asher vessel. Um, we then separate after digestion, we then separate the osmium fractions um, first into chloroform or carbon tetrachloride, and then after that into HBr. Um, and then the aqua fractions are then dried down and a series of steps done to that before we do column chemistry to separate out um, the different PGE fractions. Um, and so one thing to note with this technique is um, the amount of spike that you add to your sample is very important. You don't want to add too much spike and you don't want to add too little spike. Um, because if you add too much spike, um, the error magnification um, increases, um, but even more so when you underspike your sample, um, the error magnification um, on your measurement uh, becomes much larger. Um, if you overspike, you may not be able to separate out what the sample signature is. And that's certainly what happened with one of our samples. When I'm, I overspiked um, one of the samples, um, and as a result, we just weren't able to get um, any results for that particular sample. Um, so after you have um, done the distillation to extract osmium into, into the HBR drop here, um, you dry that down, um, and then eventually, once it's once your drop is small enough, you can load it onto these um, platinum filaments, um, and then you do um, mass spectrometry, uh, where you slowly heat up the filament um, until the osmium oxides um, start to ionize, um, and then um, this is just the this is just what um, the measurement looks like on the mass spec, um, and so you have every um, subsequent. Um, um, osmium oxide mass that you um, are um, measuring here. So then almost immediately you can see whether you've added too much 190, which is the spike um, isotope. So this is a well spiked sample, um, but if you were over spiking, the 190 signal would be way up here um, compared to the 187, which is what you really want to measure. Um, and so then you're not able to accurately um, unmix your sample signature. Um, and then you can't, you can't use that analysis. Another thing that influences the quality of your analyses is the osmium content or osmium concentration of your sample. Um, so osmium concentration is higher in prototitic samples relative to eclogitic samples. Um, and if you have a low osmium content, which is more typical for eclogitic samples, 
you have very low signals or small signals on the mass spec, and that can lead to a higher in-run uncertainty, especially in very small samples. Um, if you have a low osmium content in your sample, it also means that you have a higher background contribution to the signal. And in some cases, this can be prohibitively high, meaning that you don't have any useful data. Um, and that was also certainly the case, not for, uh, for these samples, but I worked on a suite of um, diamond inclusions from West Africa, which spent months in the lab doing all the work. Um, but in the end, we couldn't publish that data because the, the osmium content was so low and the blank contribution so high that the uncertainties on, on all of that data was meant that the data was useless. Um, so for grip prototypes, the osmium is between 0.008 and 1.96 parts per billion. Um, these are, this is pretty low, but once again, remember that this is because the signal is diluted by olivine. Um, so um, the amount of sample that we're measuring is the olivine mass, but really all the PGEs and the osmium is hosted in the micro to nano inclusions contained um, within the olivine. Um, and so here are the, the data that we have here on the right. So these are the ages that we determined for the prototypic olivines um, from GRIB. And we just compared that to um, prototype ages um, from Finland, from the Kavi Kuo Pio uh, prototypes that was published in 2006. Um, so the important thing to remember with these, um, these ages is that they're not absolute or isochron ages. These are minimum ages for the lithosphere. Um, and so it's pretty simple really is you, in the simplest case, you, you take your measured um, isotopic composition, your 187 over 188, and you simply just draw a straight line back to bulk earth. And so then it's saying that this is the minimum age for extraction from some bulk earth reservoir. Um, and we typically use either primitive upper mantle or chondrite. In my case, I've chosen to use the chondrite reservoir. Um, so this is the time of separation from bulk earth. So if you think about it in terms of the lithosphere, this is the time that the lithosphere is separated from the convecting mantle. So you're dating successive melt depletion um, events. Um, and so this is really a minimum age for extraction um, from some bulk earth, um, bulk earth reservoir. So the distribution for GRIB uh, is not really surprising considering how many proterozoic events have taken place um, in this region. So the majority of the samples are proterozoic, no big surprise. Um, and then we have this one singular um, Archean prototype um, that is uh, around 3.2 or, or older. Sorry, I went the wrong way. Um, so now I'll just um, go through the PGE contents um, of the prototypic olivine. And what I'll do is I'll start at the oldest um, and work my way towards, um, towards the youngest. Um, so here's the oldest sample. Um, so this is the Archean prototype. Um, so here's just you know, what, that, what that sample looks like. Um, and so these are, so it's the PGEs given in order of compatibility. So the most incompatible um, are platinum, palladium, and rhenium. Um, and the most compatible um, is osmium, iridium, ruthenium. Um, so we have the primitive upper mantle estimate at the top. Um, and you can see, so that's relatively flat, um, but the PGE patterns for um, this sample is depleted in the most incompatible elements, which is fairly typical for um, prototype from the lithospheric mantle. Um, so what is the other evidence that we have um, for Archean lithosphere in this region? Um, so also at GRIB, um, there are 2.8 um, GA mantle eclogites, and there's also 2.7 zircons. So well, this is not as old as the 3.2 age that we have. Um, and this is because a lot of the region stabilized at 2.8, 2.7 because of collisional processes. Um, so certainly there isn't um, in the mantle anyway, um, a 3.2 signature that has been has been recognized, um, but in the crust, 
Um, there, in the broader Baltic Finnescandian shield, there is crust um, that extends um, past 3GA. Um, so once again, this is um, from Earth's oldest rocks. This is just a compilation. Um, and it shows zircons that have ages extending um, from the Paleoarchean. Um, but a lot of these older zircons also have this 2.8, 2.7 um, GA overprint. So even if they are um, older than 3 GA, they still have this younger overprint um, at the time of continent stabilization at 2.8, uh, 2.7. Um, okay, so the next, the next event is rifting and collision. Um, oh, sorry, rifting and continental breakup, um, 2.5, 2.1 GA. Um, and so here's one of the samples um, that um, has, has an age that overlaps um, with these tectonic events. Uh, and so once again, the samples are fairly depleted in the most incompatible in the most incompatible PGE, so platinum, palladium, rhenium. And so once again, fairly, fairly typical for depleted peridotites. Um, and so this indicates that um, a lot of the lithosphere experienced melt depletion at the time of rifting and continental breakup. Um, and so potentially this was more on the margins um, of the rift, so off axis, uh, but certainly thermal reworking at this time caused melt depletion in the cratonic lithosphere. Um, and we can see that then um, in these PGE patterns. Um, so we know that um, plume related melting um, of the lithospheric mantle occurred at this time, because this is models that have been put forward by, by various researchers um, whose names I unfortunately cannot pronounce. Um, um, and so the samples were the 2.5, 2.1 ages likely reflect depletion um, during plume related heating um, of the lithospheric mantle. Uh, so this has also been um, documented um, in the Northern Slave Craton in the Mackenzie plume when it thinned, uh, significantly thinned uh, the cratonic lithosphere below the Northern Slave. Um, and so um, in this case, Xinga Liu from also from Alberta, but now um, working in China, um, he's um, did quite a bit of modeling showing how the lithospheric um, architecture um, is, can influence how much a plume affects uh, the lithospheric mantle and how much then, if you already have a thin spot, you can create a trap for upwelling, um, upwelling mantle melts um, and also for these residues produced from, um, from mantle melting. Um, and then you can also have thin spots in the lithospheric mantle um, that can be healed by vertical accretion um, during, plume, during plume melting. Um, okay, so next up we have Proterozoic um, Collisional Tectonics. Um, and so here we don't have many samples that actually show sort of this 1.9 age. So there's, there's this one sample here in yellow. Um, that's the one shown here on the left um, as, that has this 1.9 age. Um, and it's once again, all the samples fairly depleted in palladium and rhenium in the most incompatible uh, PGEs. So it shows that all these processes, all these um, tectonic processes occurring during the Proterozoic significantly depleted the lithospheric mantle. Um, and so not really, I think, destroying the lithospheric mantle, but instead causing further melt depletion and further residues um, that, are, that can then become part of the Grotonic lithosphere um, architecture. Um, and so um, further evidence uh, for 1.9, 1.8 GA rocks um, at Grib, um, this has been documented um, as zircons with these ages um, in the eclogites. There's also lower, in the lower crust, there's granulites and gneisses with these ages. Um, and then also um, zircon, UPB in zircon also indicates 1.9, 1.8 ages uh, in the lower crustal granulites. Um, and so here's just a tectonic model showing, um, certainly from crustal studies, um, showing um, the processes associated with collisional tectonics um, at 1.9. And so just to show sort of where um, the suture zone is, uh, th these same authors 
show here, this is the boundary sort of between the lower plate and the upper plate um, here along the Kola province and then subduction then occurring towards uh, the southwest and then grib sort of over here just, just off this diagram. But certainly um, within this region where active subduction and collisional tectonics was taking place. So it's no surprise then that the majority of the mantle really is, is Protozoic rather than Archean, even though one Archean sample <laughs> was preserved. Um, and so then we also have these um, younger ages. Uh, so it's not clear what tectonic events these ages correlate with, but low degree magmatism has been documented extensively in Finland um, uh, during this time. So um, 760, 750, and then there's also 1.2, 1.1 alkaline ultramafic magmatism. So a lot of low degree magmatism. And I mean, this is happening fairly far away. It's in Finland. Um, so it's, it's not clear yet whether these events also apply to the region um, below GRIB. But I just thought it was interesting that there are certainly events taking place at a similar time. But you know, we'll continue to think about this, these ages and, and how, to, how to interpret those. Um, and so the diamond, the one diamond bearing sample that we have um, has a TRD age of around 1.6, 1.6 GA. Um, and it's actually super depleted, it has no PGEs whatsoever. It only has some osmium, also pretty low. Um, and so we have a super depleted rock, even though the olivine magnesium number is fairly fertile. Uh, it's certainly very depleted in, in the PGEs. Um, and so we're thinking about how to sort of explain um, how a metasomatic mineral like, like diamond infiltrated through this rock, bringing in fluids and melts, yet the sample remains fairly depleted. Um, so here are the conclusions. Um, so the cratonic root below grub has some preserved Archean terrains. We have one, peridotite, uh, that has an Archean TRD age of around 3.2. Uh, there certainly are also Archean eclogites, even though they're slightly younger, they represent 2.8, 2.7 collisional processes and stabilization of, of the scrotonic region. Um, and then we also have the lower crustal granulites um, that are also 2.8, 2.7. The majority of the samples um, that we analyzed show evidence for Protozoic um, either origin or reworking. Um, and so this was during uh, rifting um, due to a mantle plume, a continental breakup, and then um, collision again at around 1.9. So the diamondiferous mantle is associated with significant Protozoic overprinting, but this seems to be the emerging view from crotonic regions globally is that you don't necessarily need to only target regions that are depleted or key in terrains. Um, the majority of regions now show um, significant uh, protozoic reworking and that doesn't seem to be an issue, issue for diamonds. Um, so the diamond ages in this region is not clear because um, the diamond host rock certainly saw younger reworking events um, and that was around 1.6 or older, um, but certainly the diamonds, not sure how old they are, but I'm guessing probably Protozoic. Um, so rifting and later collision didn't appear to harm the cratonic lithosphere. Um, the, thick lith the lithosphere was rethickened or preserved um, during the Protozoic, along with its diamonds. Um, and so what's different here compared to regions where subduction and collision destroyed the cratonic lithosphere? Um, so that's something, um, something certainly to think about. Um, so Graham Pearson has um, a new definition for, for cratons and that's, it's been accepted, it's impressed, so it's imminent, I'm not sure what the publication date is, um, that cratons are coherent blocks of the lithosphere that are stable for time periods in excess of a billion years. Um, and so um, the, thick, the thickest lithosphere is not necessarily exclusive to the oldest crust. Um, and so certainly seismics um, show that the majority of the Earth's crust that is older than 1GA has these thick lithospheric roots. Um, so as long as you have a thick lithospheric root um, that has a cool geotherm, 
you likely are still going to have a region that is conducive um, for diamond growth and preservation. Um, and so this definition works really well, I think, for the majority of cratons and certainly also for um, the Kola Karelian cratons, because a lot of cratons globally have experienced repeated episodes of tectonic reworking. And this clearly doesn't seem to be an issue um, for diamond prospectivity. So thank you so much. Hopefully there's a few questions. Thank you, Karen. Um, I'll open it up to questions now. Um, I'll start with one. Do we have any idea of the diamond ages in that part of the world at all? Has there been any work done? Not that I'm aware of. Maybe someone has done and it's not published, but I'm not aware of any diamond ages. Um, I'm guessing, I'm guessing Proterozoic based on everything I've just said, but who knows? So I'd love to do a diamond dating study at some point if we can get samples with uh, large enough, large enough inclusions, that would be great. So either silicate, so garnet and kind of pyroxene, you can do the single silicate dating. Um, but if you, if they are large enough sulfides, uh, you can do some rhenium osmium, but there aren't any ages so far as, as far as I'm aware. It seems to me that's a pretty important test of some of these ideas. I agree. Um, so maybe our Russian colleagues can get, get going on that. Um, other questions, comments? I'll open the floor. Steve, Steve. Steve. I'm going to stay uh, with my, my my picture here. It's pretty early here in the in North America, so I'm not presentable. Um, I want to say hello to all all my friends on the call: Sonia, Dorit, George, Fanas, and you, Craig, and 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 um, say Karen, that was a great talk. Um, so this area of this of the Baltica Shield seems to have a similarity with the Siberian Craton in that I know that um, um, uh, Dmitry Yanov and Rick have been looking for years for older prototypes in the Siberian Craton and um, have never found them. You know, they're looking for stuff that's older than two and a half a billion or up close to three billion. And so this seems to share a feature with, with the Siberian Craton of being completely, if there was older stuff there, completely overprinted. So do you think that the Craton was 3.2 and just was very pervasively uh, reworked and, and you know, without any kind of um, hint of, of uh, much hint of the, of the older stuff? Yeah, so, well, on the one hand, we have a very limited sample set. So potentially if we analyze more samples, the Archean signature may become stronger. So that's one, one issue. Um, but that aside, the crust does, the crust has, I mean, 3.5, 3.1 ages are the oldest ages in, in the region. Um, so certainly it has an Archean, it has a Archean Meso Archean heritage. Um, I just think that it was significantly reworked um, during these later processes. And, and with regard to the olivine that you have, was there any in the microprobe work on it that was done, if any was done, is there any, zone, especially in that one that was really depleted um, the, at the end that you showed, was there any zoning in the olivine or anything to show what kind of reaction there was between it and infiltrating melt? Uh, I can check with Elena. Um, so I'll have to get back to you on that. I'm not sure, uh, but I can check with Elena and um, we can we can get back to you on that. Yeah, that, that was the diamond bearing sample, right? The last one. Um, yeah, I think that I think if I remember correctly. Yeah, this one. Yeah. Yeah, we can check. That's a good good idea. We'll check. Just to, just to follow up on that a little bit, you know, when when uh, Amber looked at that layers sample that she published in GCA, a lot of the osmium was in the fines in in the inner granular spaces where the infiltrating fluids would be and 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 diamonds would form. So your olivine there is just you know kind of preserving whatever reacted with that fluid and, and kind of yeah. a ghost of the signal of what went through that rock. And so. Um, it's always very tricky to project, you know, kind of what happened in the bulk of the rock when all you've got to work with is the olive. Yeah, so we also have the um, the garnet and the CPX. Actually, let me just go further. Um, 
So this, the diamond bearing ones here, it's also, it's very, the CPX is also very depleted. Um, where's the, I've got stuff in the way here. Here's the diamond bearing ones up here. Uh, it's also fairly depleted, um, but mostly in the CPX, it's very, so the olivine is very depleted and the CPX is very depleted. So we need to think a bit about how that's, how that's really possible or what was really going on here. Yeah, Some of the amount that I don't know. Yeah, it certainly seems like a different fluid in terms of how it. Yeah, affects. well, that's the tricky thing with these samples, right? Because like it, it seems that every mineral almost is its own system. Because so, right. olivine is the original thing, and then you have garnet coming through, and then CPX forming. So it's like you can't take the ro the, the rock as you know one system. Like it almost seems like everything is disconnected a little bit. Great, yeah. thank you. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions or comments? Karen, maybe just one more from me. Uh, thinking about yeah. this, I mean, there are fairly major implications for exploration here, uh, particularly in- <laughs> Nothing the, really that's, that's that new, right? Because we've known for a while that, you know, you know, well, diamond, of course, it's made of somatic, so it's reworking. So you're not gonna, look for depleted Archean terrains, you are going to look for terrain that has seen a little bit of reworking. Well, I'm not sure everybody's got that message from my understanding of the business at this point in time. Ah. Um, but in terms of the, in terms of Archean diamond ages, um, you know, the classic localities are, are Kimberley and Finch and so forth. Do we have Archean diamond ages um, from sort of uh, Proterozoic or or reworked Proterozoic Cratonic edge terrains? I'm not sure, I can't remember. I'm thinking, I don't think so. But also globally, I, sh I should have put that plot in this presentation as well. So I made a compilation of global diamond ages for a chapter that we're working on. Um, and certainly the majority of diamonds seem to be post here now a lot of protozoic uh, diamonds that we have dated. So it would be, yeah, I should maybe go back and look at, at the crustal terrains, whether you know, some of the older, older diamond ages occur in younger terrains. That would be interesting to, to make that comparison. And is it, is it fair to say that... Um, like... <laughs> <laughs> we're... I mean, the implication coming out of this is that if we have a tectonic event uh, in the crust, we're going to see something in the diamond ages in the lithospheric mantle. And I Correct. think that's... Yeah. Because a lot of, you know, from this compilation of diamond ages that we've, that we've made, certainly, you know, decades of studies on diamond ages have now shown that diamonds are a very accurate recorder of tectonic processes that are occurring um, in, in a region. Sonia, you've got your hand raised. Yeah, hi. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, we can. Yes. Oh, man, I've, I've had some problems here today, and I'm doing this on my mobile, which doesn't help. Karen, I didn't get where, what depth was the, the, um, the Archean xenolith from? Is it relatively deep or relatively shallow, or did you not get a, a, a pressure estimate from that one? That's a good thing that I should have done. Yeah, let me let me <laughs> do that. <laughs> I haven't, I haven't, I've calculated the PTs, but I haven't actually like looked specifically where the Archean one is from. I should I should have done that. All right. Well, otherwise, great talk and nice to see you. Thank you. All right, thanks for joining, Sonia. Steve, you've got your hand up again, or are you is that from before? No, I, I put it back up again. I was just going to chime in that you know you asked the question, do we have any? terrains that have been reworked that where the older diamonds survive. I think that was the question you asked, Karna. Yeah, basically. Kind of what comes closest to that signal, although it's not the oldest diamonds, would be the Kimberley block in Australia, right? Where yeah. you've got definitely sulfide evidence, you know, sulfide evidence for uh, Archean reworking. You don't have diamonds of that age, but, but yeah. uh, you know. Um, yeah, but I guess Ambra's ages for Argyle show that there's right, Argyle. Like the lithosphere and the initial ratio from my diamond ages at Ellendale right. also show that there is an Archean lithosphere, but the crust is certainly all Proterozoic. Right. Um, and the diamond ages, 
also Proterozoic. Right. That's weird. Oh. Anyway, great, great talk, Karen. Really excellent talk. Cool. Thanks, Steve. <clears throat> Any other questions or comments? If not, Karen, thank you very much for this. Um, Thanks, Craig, for the invite. I appreciate it. We, we will put this lecture up onto the GSSA YouTube channel. It'll probably be up early next week. So everybody's uh, invited to go and visit that. Um, if there's no more questions, uh, there's there might be some chat comments here. No new questions. Um, with, with that, I'd like to close the meeting. Karen, thank you very much. Thanks everybody for attending and a good a hello from Southern Africa to everybody around the world. Thanks for joining us. Thanks everyone. Uh, Bye. I'll close the meeting now. Thank you. Thanks, Greg. Bye-bye.